Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Yati, and thanks, Alan, for the introductions. And uh, first of all, I'd like to, even though the lights are very bright here, I'd like to thank all of you for coming here at the very end of the day. And also, I'm afraid to dispel any thoughts that you're going to see a re rerun of that fantastic mobile graphics that Hans Rosling gave you this morning. But anyway, we'll try and make it stimulating and interesting. So my topic is, in fact, I've also changed the title a little bit to be Water and Agriculture, Threats and Opportunities. And I want to sort of draw some of the sort of interconnectivities between agricultural water use and the urban areas. I mean, we know that, of course, food is very important for rural and urban residents. We know that uh, you know, the water supply comes from, from catchments. We know that some of the waste from urban areas goes into downstream areas used for, for irrigation, etc. But I think there are some, some broader areas and reasons why the two sectors should cooperate a little bit more, and I'd like to go into that a little bit today. First, I want to start on an optimistic note. I think agriculture can be seen to have been a success. From the Green Revolution, you see the tr dramatic increase in productivity over the years in both developed and developing economies, and at the same time, a reduction in under, undernourishment. And this has been quite striking, I mean, particularly in, in China and Vietnam, with the uh, advent of economic growth, reduction in, in malnutrition and undernourishment. Quite, so. Also, that's been driven by high crop yields coming out of these uh, advances from the research laboratories and the closing of the gap between what's possible in the laboratory and what we're seeing in the field. And at the same time, we recognize that it's not all high-tech intensive agriculture. About two billion smallholders around the world are responsible for about 70% of the food, and only about a quarter of the food is actually traded on global markets. And I'm going to come back to that because it does have some important uh, consequences also for food security uh, in relation to, and, it, and also to stability in, in urban areas. Now, our natural understanding of irrigation, which is the, the backbone of agri uh, agricultural water management, where 40% of food is produced from about 20% of the area due to irrigation, is of the large systems, the reservoirs, the canal systems of the colonial times, the sort of um, things you sort of see in the Punjab set up by the British about 100 or more years ago. But in fact, in recent times, the growth in irrigation has come from more small-scale, groundwater-driven irrigation. And now you can see from this graphic that in fact, groundwater is almost double the amount of formal canal irrigation. And the question is, you know, do the institutions actually reflect, reflect that change? But this success has also come at the consequence of a series of impacts. And work done by Rockstrom and others in 2009 and then updated a couple of years ago on these 10 planetary boundaries show that there are some tipping points which, if exceeded, could threaten the sustainability of this agricultural system and even beyond, beyond that. And agriculture is a cause, or one of the causes, of some of these tipping points being exceeded in terms of uh, the nitrogen cycle, coming up next maybe the phosphorus cycle, also biodiversity loss. And we also see that played out in many areas in terms of water and land degradation, in terms of salinity, the soil loss, degraded uh, areas, uh, the amount of uh, polluted water, 12,000 cubic kilometers of polluted water, uh, deforestation, and the contribution of agriculture, which is very significant, to climate change and CO2 emissions. We also see it in terms of the way that this groundwater has been used. Here, a slide on India, almost a clear difference, north-south, between the areas in the west of the country which had over-abstracted as a result of perverse uh, incentives, electricity subsidies, allowing people to pump uh, at will and overdraft the groundwater. And then the areas on the eastern area, the eastern Gangetic Plain, for example, where there is still plenty of replenishable groundwater left. So we are getting ourselves into quite a serious situation here. At the same time, biodiversity uh, is, is diminishing. This work from uh, WWF and UNEP, WCMC, shows the reduction in species over the last 30 or 40 years. And you can see, particularly in terms of freshwater species, this dramatic drop, you know, almost half the species lost in the last 
30 or so years. And we see a number of trends happening in agriculture too. So this shows the changes in food price index. Until the, if you saw the, the first part of this graph, which isn't there, you'll see gradually diminishing food prices happening. And then in around the turn of the millennium, we start to see a trend of food prices rising. And then it's not just rising uniformly, but then you have these spikes caused by a number of issues in terms of some speculation around agricultural commodities and trade, the shift in some areas to subsidies on biofuels, also the spikes in energy, causing, which is also a major uh, constituent of the prices of agriculture uh, commodities, transport, production, etc. And this also has social instability factors, as we'll see in a moment. So biofuel production I mentioned, I mean, this cartoon came from uh, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, uh, Sentinel and shows you know, somebody, a, a young child, desperate to put food on the plate and just being offered the residue biofuel uh, from, from the corn crop. So I think you know, we also need to see how this sort of linked up thinking, what are the consequences of policy change in one area having in another area. But let's look at food. I mean, who is consuming food and how much of your budget is actually spent on food? If you look at, in the US, for example, only about 7% of the average annual, average family budget is spent on food. In Sweden, apparently, uh, it's about 10%. Come Central Asia, 50-50. But in many parts of the developing world, you see actually that figure is about 70% of the budget going on food, with the balance being available then for for medicines, for, for rent, for accommodation, uh, for education, etc. So what happens if you have one of those spikes? What happens then to those people in this who are paying already 70%? It means that the amount of money left over, if they're not going to starve, is diminished for what they can spend on the other things. And so something falls off, or they get into debt. And I think, coming back to Hans's presentation this morning, depending on where you sit, in these graphs, you have a different perspective of how serious a price rise, uh, price, a hike in prices is, like the ones we saw in 2008 and 2011. And those food, food price hikes also caused shortages in some areas, a picture here from Mozambique, and in some cases they actually led to social unrest, and in some cases some researchers are now even linking this sort of uh, the, the food price hike and insecurity as one possible cause of the Arab Spring. At the same time, as we develop, our diets are changing, and we see that. There's a shift towards, to, towards livestock, meat, and dairy products. So that the, the total population rise of uh, the worm, world's farm animals has trebled in the same time that the population has doubled. And we can see that what's happening in India and China with an increase in meat production, particularly in China, which is getting towards the sorts of levels you see in the States. And also then not meat in India, but in terms of dairy products, a similar sort of rather astronomic rise. And the key point here is that to grow one kilogram of meat protein takes about 100 times more water than one kilogram of grain protein. And water is also being traded, as we know, across the globe. And this is leading to foreign direct investment in some areas in land, but not only in land, but also in, in water. And it's, so here, an example from Africa, where about 3.4 million hectares of land is under foreign direct investment from countries outside of Africa at the moment, predominantly in these six countries listed here, which accounts for about 50%. And although water is sometimes mentioned in those agreements, the amount of water that may be abstracted and the consequences for the people in that area as you move to more, more commercial areas, uh, more commercial agriculture, sorry, is, is not so, so clear. The trends also continue in terms of, as we develop, the changes in, in water use. So again, low and middle income countries, about 82% of the water is used in agriculture. Whereas as we move towards the high income countries, that proportion shifts and more goes into industry and urban areas. And in many OECD countries, that shift has taken place maybe over a period of over 100 or more years since the Industrial Revolution. What we're seeing now in many countries is that period, that taking place in 
a period of one generation. And I think then that raises the institutional and the management questions about how do we deal with that shift and that transition. So here I'm starting to get into the question of why the urban sector should be really interested in what the agricultural sector is doing. And again, I think it's graphically shown here in, country, in cities which are expanding incredibly quickly. You'll see 2003 on the left, situation in Hyderabad, and how it's mushroomed in size in just 11, 11 years. And the consequence of that is that Hyderabad is now pulling in much more water from further afield, from groundwater, and from interbasin diversions, having consequences not only on what that, that water was used for before for agriculture, but also in terms of the volumes of wastewater and the quality of that wastewater as it goes back into the river, into the river system. And the question for many of the cities facing this type of rapid expansion is, are the systems in place really to, to manage that? Are the institutional boundaries changing, the responsibility of the municipalities changing at the same speed as the actual urban uh, uh, periphery is changing? We're also seeing massive demographic changes of another sort. We're seeing feminization of, of uh, agriculture, case here of Nepal, where the huge migration of males, young males, from Nepal to the Middle East for work has led to a situation where there are many females now are heading the uh, households in, in, and the farming. In itself, not necessarily a bad thing, but if the institutions don't change to recognize the role of women and allow them to have access to services and to credit and role in management uh, bodies, then you have a problem. Labor is also an issue. The population is also aging. The average age of farmers is now reaching about 60. And many young, far young farming families don't want to stay in farming. They want to move to the urban areas. Again, and so what is the role then? What does that mean? And actually, you're seeing the consequence that in some countries, Vietnam, China, Malaysia, for example, Whereas maybe 20 years ago, we were worried that there was going to be an increasing fragmentation of land and how was that going to be viable, we're now seeing a consolidation of land. And with that, opportunities for more commercial, more efficient, more uh, agriculture and water use. So that's agriculture as a success story, but with problems. It's also some of the trends that are affecting agriculture. And now I just wanted to go on to quickly talk about you know, what we need to do to manage it better. And four areas I want to talk about very, very quickly because I know we're running out of time. But I want to be reasonably positive, maybe as Hans was called, a possibilist. In terms of, I think there is scope for increasing production and work we did several years ago showed that particularly in those low yield areas, there is tremendous scope for increasing yield. We see that massive groundwater still exists in, in Africa. But let's not make the same mistakes that were made in that western part of India in terms of how we abstract that, because it's very fragile. And we know that if it's mismanaged and the wrong subsidies and incentives are put in place, then we will end up with lots of red dots in that area. We know there are incremental steps to getting people away from just irrigating with buckets to irrigating with pumps, including this small-scale entrepreneur who's going around and selling pump, his pump to, for a couple of hours to, to uh, farmers in Tanzania. In West Bengal, in this area where there is groundwater, we see that by removing some of the red tape and the connect, connection charges and the problems of getting a license, you can actually affect about four and a half million people and get them on the stepladder of irrigation and supplementary irrigation. We also see that cross-sectoral co cooperation is possible. We've seen in China, this is more than 10 years ago now, where transfers from urban areas, from, from agriculture to urban areas, resulted in, in an increase in water productivity in agriculture of three times, not 30%, but three times, as a result of financing that came from the, this transfer to finance those productivity increases. We see in Latin America the opportunities for benefit sharing and payments from utility consumers downstream to finance catchment management systems upstream. We see more advanced systems happening in Australia with buyback from irrigators, transfer to environment, looking more uh, buying between irrigators and things, maybe too advanced still for some other countries, but it just shows that there is this range of possibilities. We also see the options for increasing efficiency and resilience. For example, solar pumps are going to come and reduce the burden on 
fossil fuel uh, electricity generation in India, for example. We see drip irrigation, which we've talked about for 20 or 30 years, when I was at university 30 years ago, which has only just started to take off because the incentive framework now is being put in place to do this. So large-scale farms are now taking up drip irrigation. We see some of this land degradation being addressed. Saline soils, this example from the Bright Spots initiative was where licorice, you know, what we think of in candy sometimes, is actually a very good crop for reclaiming saline soils and at the same time providing fodder and an input into the pharmaceutical industry. From my sister institute, the International Rice Research Institute, we see new varieties coming up which are going to be resistant to floods. So this rice, what they call the scuba rice, can actually be completely inundated for 17 days and still give about 70% of the yield, providing farmers with that sort of insurance that they will still get a livelihood after a catastrophic flood event. We see possibilities for managed aquifer recharge, where you take at the peak of the flood and try and store it underground to protect not only the urban areas, the sorts of things we saw and the damage we saw in Bangkok in 2011, but also then providing water for summer irrigation. But how do we make this operational? And finally, the last point, something which has been talked about in the halls of this room and this conference much during uh, today and in the subsequent days, the reuse of waste. But here I'm particularly looking at the situation in, in some countries where treatment is not going to be a reality for the next generation. So what do you do then? We know people are using water. But this is the sort of thing we end up with, this sort of pollution of land bodies, of water bodies, because we've provided the toilets, we've provided the septic tanks, but we haven't then provided the treatment works to deal with that afterwards. So what are the options there? This is one option for the, what, using wastewater. So for the farmer, clearly, which one would you choose? You know, your, your productivity. For the consumer, but, you know, are there pathogens on the one on the left? I don't know. So this is the sort of thing. So can you work with other agencies to make this safer and to sort of make it, it's going to happen anyway, so how do we make it happen in a safer environment? And we've been working with WHO and FAO and US EPA to try and bring in some of the simple things you can do to actually make that a safer practice. As I say, treatment is not always the answer. This is about 70 treatment, wastewater treatment and fecal sludge treatment plants from a West African country where Okay, how many of them work? This is how many actually work now, for various reasons, because of lack of electricity, lack of capacity, lack of maintenance costs, and things like this. So we have to provide some alternative, again, an incremental approach. And the co-composting of fertilizer and turning of, of fecal sludge and turning that into a fertilizer which is safe to handle and safe to yield, use and provides the same level as yields as a chemical fertilizer is some of the work that I think is, is looking particularly promising. So with that, I'd like to, to finish and just to say that I think that there is a tremendous scope for agriculture and the urban sector to work together because together I think we can find some of those solutions which agriculture on its own will not be able to find. Thank you very much.